Peter, I have struggled in life with trying to become a theist. You have something called developmental theism. Do you think that would help me? Thanks, Robert. I'm not sure anyone should struggle with becoming a theist. I mean, <clears throat> but still, um, developmental theism. Um, what I do there is I offer a, an account of, which is meant to reconcile the God of the philosophers with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, not really. I don't like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob much, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, the Old Testament's rather a nasty book. But um, reconcile the two. And it's based upon the idea that God changes. Now, there are arguments, arguments in the philosophical tradition that God is unchangeable. Right. But if you look at those arguments, they're not really very convincing ones. They have some Platonist presuppositions about what's the ideal state and the so-called perfect being perfect being the idea that if you were a perfect being you'd do nothing um and well, well they would say they wouldn't put it quite that way to be fair <laughs> they would say that if you're a perfect being which is the highest being we can imagine and that should be god then you're already maximally uh, in all characteristics you know all powerful all knowing all good perfectly free yeah. and therefore if you have any change you're going to deviate from perfection there are two problems with that argument for God's unchangeability. The first is there might be more than one way of being perfect. Um, and if that's the sort of most obvious objection, to be perfect is to be that than which there is no better or greater, but that doesn't imply there's a unique way of being perfect. The, the other problem, which I think is more serious, is that uh, it suggests the only reason we could have for change would be our own self-betterment. But the whole idea of God being loving is that God might do things for the good of others, not just for God's own betterment. And there should be at least be the possibility of God changing for the sake of others without thereby being any the less perfect. You know, I like that. I, I don't like a God that doesn't change. Again, what I like doesn't make any difference to reality, I'm sure. But but given a choice, I like a God who can change. Um, so take me from the early stages of God in your view of developmental theism, and, and let's see how God changes. What is the, the earliest vision or impression we can have of the God you're talking about? Okay. My idea is you start off with a God that is simply knows all the possibilities and can choose. So a God of knowledge and power. A God without any kind of personality or moral character who just chooses. And this is very like the God of the philosophers. And God could just have stayed that way and that would be the God of the philosophers. But among the choices God can make, according to my speculation, is that God can choose to become something different. God can choose to limit her or his powers. Actually, at that stage, God is it rather than her or him or her anyway. God could choose to limit its powers in one way or another. There are lots of choices God could make. Is this God uh, a, uh, a, a, a conscious or a conscious being? Uh, is it a person? You said it doesn't have a personality and there's no moral um, quality to it. There's, there's power and possibilities. Yes. Well, there's awareness. Okay, um, okay, that's fair. There's awareness. A, there's awareness. There's awareness of the possibilities. And we want to keep this being, I mean, sorry, we want to keep our hypothesis about this being as simple as we can sure. uh, for obvious intellectual reasons, which is why I want to leave out any kind of moral character at this stage. Now, how do you choose without moral character? Well, remember, you've got nothing to lose, as it were. You haven't got any limitations. So I claim, and this is another matter, a debatable matter, that... Um, if you make a purely rational choice 
and you're not constrained by anything. You will choose what is good, but good in a kind of cold, objective way. You will just maximize the utility. So my idea is that God starts off as a utility maximizer. And this is not a very nice sort of God. Now, is utility maximizer for itself or, or, or for, for others? Or, or can you d- yeah, differentiate? Good, good question, Rob. Above, just overall. I mean, you think about utilitarians is that in principle, it doesn't matter whether it's you or the other. I mean, one of the things that's so obnoxious about, well, Real utilitarians aren't obnoxious people, but that's because they don't really stick to utilitarian rules. But um, what's obnoxious about utilitarianism is that if it was, if I could get an advantage, more advantage by being selfish, uh, <laughs> then you would lose. Right, I would be selfish. But if you would get more advantage by my being unselfish than I would lose, be I'd be unselfish. You know, yeah. and yeah, so the same would apply to God and. Oh, okay. Right. So initially, God, there's in this sort of position. And this is not the sort of God of religion. And it's not a God whom I'd be prepared to worship. And so therefore, strictly speaking, it doesn't deserve the honorific God. But um, it's not a worshipful being, but just a powerful being who, who can do, bring about a world of any kind. Now, my you're not worshiping it because it doesn't have a moral character to it, or or it's not looking after you. Why aren't you worshiping it? Well, my idea of worship is you involves trust, and you wouldn't trust this sort of God. You don't you know wouldn't... what he's going to do, or it's going to do. It could lie to you, for example. Yeah, for, I mean, if, if, for if the good, thought, for, for, for the utilitarian yeah. maximization. Yeah, sure, um, good idea. Um, and the whole of religion could be uh, a divine lie on this view. Hmm. You know, God could, I mean, I'm not saying this is the case, but there's nothing to stop this kind of utilitarian God setting up various sorts of revelations, thinking, well, they're these human beings, and at this particular time in history, I think... Uh, I, I like this guy already. <laughs> uh, this would be a, uh, a good way for them to behave. I'll give them this whole lot of nonsense, but it'll make them behave better. And, yeah, it's a shame people having false beliefs. That's bad. But in this circumstance, it's for the general good. And when it ceases to be for the general good, well, you know, I'll make wipe sure, wipe it out. All right. Now, I, I got it. I got the, <laughs> I got the God. I, I, I kind of identify uh, with it right away. Uh, to take me to the next step. Okay. The next step is this. God, um, what is really good? And... What I suggest is when we look around at the world and we also consult our own sort of um, intuitions, feelings about this, what's really valuable, and here I go all sort of Valentine's Day and soppy and so on, what's really valuable is that people have opportunities for for love, um, to be unselfish giving. And when you look around at the world, what you see is a very hard, a very unpleasant school for love. It provides opportunities, most of which we don't take. And so the sort of God who'd produce that would be a God who attaches enormous value to uh, love, to people overcoming obstacles, people. And love is a, is a fairly broad concept here. So, um, you know, there are these moments when someone, for example, is genuinely repentant and, you know, it brings tears to our eyes, but it's rare. Well, I shouldn't say it's rare. How do I know? I'm just a cynic, okay. But it's not not as common as we would hope. And there are moments of genuine love and there are moments, and that seems to be what's really valuable because we all know it's not a very pleasant place for most people. Now, we're privileged, but I don't think it's a particularly pleasant place for us privileged people. And it certainly isn't for the majority of, of humanity. Okay, you don't have to convince me on that. You got, okay. you got me. Yeah. So, What does that all, mean about God, though? What it means is that God values something more highly than our comfort and our pleasures and our lack of pain. Okay. And I think God values love. So God sets up things so that, at least in this corner of the universe, it's all about us struggling collectively, individually, and to, 
you know, it, there's something noble about this, something that is, is wonderful, but the cost is enormous. Okay, look, that, that end data point is, is pretty good. I mean, I, I can buy that. And, and you, you had me at the beginning with this, uh, this, this neutral god of, of power and possibility, but no morality, the utilitarian god. Now, how do you get from one to the other? Why did that utilitarian god produce this world of hard love? Because that's what this god finds you know, rational to produce, valuable. But now this is, the, this is the, the speculative twist, is that it doesn't just apply to us, it applies to God, him or herself. Okay. If being loving is so valuable, why be the hard utilitarian? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's an. So uh, God changes. God changes. I mean, that's a big change. That's not like this little change in God's mind. I mean, this is like a big character change. Yeah, God becomes something loving, and that may involve. It's like a, it's like a conversion. Yes, God gets converted. Li like that, and maybe that involves. You're the first guy to convert God. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe God. Well, I believe God is a trinity, but I'm rather orthodox actually. But uh, maybe God becomes Could've a fooled trinity. Me. <laughs> becomes a trinity because it's a community of love. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So you start off with the idea of this impersonal God whom you wouldn't worship, who is um, really a God of the philosophers, bit of a bastard, but it sets things up uh, thinking, oh, well, in anthropomorph we are, I'm anthropomorphizing a bit sure. when they say God thinks, but God sees the wonderful world of hard love, tough love, and but God also sees is if love such a wonderful thing to be, God becomes loving, and to do that, God limits him, her, them, selves, power, because that requires limitation. Love requires kenosis. Kenosis meaning an empty. meaning emptying of self. Um, you can't. Well, love where there is a power imbalance tends to be incomplete. Now, it's a little bit tricky because one of the paradigms of love is parental love. And of course, parental love does involve a power imbalance. But uh, ideally, love, when it's reciprocated, can't just be um, of uh, an all-powerful and a powerless being. Mm. And... Um, it's a nice illustration of this in the um, Arabian Nights with the story of, of Aladdin and the lamp. Now, there's a kind of expurgated version from Disney, but in the original, the um, question arises as to why the magician doesn't just command the princess to be essentially his sex slave. I mean, he's a magician. He's got the lamp. And he gives the right answer, but I want her to love me. And he can't command that. Um, he can only do that by, by being weak to the extent of not using the lamp. It's like that with God. God has to, um, to become loving, God has to, be, I think, be, be weakened to some extent. So God um, changes by turning from a cold kind of utilitarian God to a loving God. And God uh, takes on whatever limitation is required to be loving. Now, we could say more about that, but that's the, the view in, in, in a nutshell. And among other things, it's meant to provide an emotionally satisfying response to the problem of evil. And um, because... The God who set the world up with its propensity for evils was this cold sort of utilitarian God. The God who cares and would remove them if she, he could, is the God who is now limited in power, has power, power to, um, but is not powerless, but is limited in power. The reason I think God is limited in power is I think God sets up laws of nature that are necessary in a rather strong sense and constrain all agents, including God. And that's permanent. And that's permanent, yes. And so this God, this utilitarian, neutrally moral God, 
at some point had to make this uh, eternal decision, if you will, to convert himself, itself, into a God that is loving, limited, and emptying. That's a that's a big decision, bigger than any decisions I've made. It's, I think it's bigger in its consequences, of course, but I do hold to a, you know, I'm proudly anthropomorphic. <laughs> so I, I don't have my, I'm not impressed by people who, who think of God as totally other, etc., because the only thing we have to understand God is ourselves. I mean, I'm, I think that we human beings, for our limitations, are the sort of most wonderful things there are in the world around us, impressed though I am by the physical sciences and by biology. Um, and um, God's decision is like our decisions, um, just uh, greater in scale, on my view. So when you say it's um, you know, not like anything you, you know of, I, I, I doubt it. I think in a, you know, on a good day, that is what we all do. M make decisions that, that limit ourselves for the sake of others. And I think God is doing the same kind of thing. And ultimately, I think God does it, this primordial God does it, because um, it's sort of obvious. You look at the possibilities. You look at um, the way things might be. And this is just such, you know, and it's, um, you know, sort of the possibilities, as it were, luminous. They <laughs> sort of, you know, leap out at you. And um, you, you, you go for what is, what, is, what is good. And it's not, in a way, a hard choice for God. It's just, in a sense, the rational choice. So you make a cold, calculating, rational choice to be a kind of, um, uh, you know, n emotional and uh, concerned being because it's so much better to be an emotional, concerned <laughs> being than to be a cold, rational chooser. <laughs>